past couple of years, been very happy to partner up with Harvardwood to try to expand our programming and expand the people who come to talk to our members and to Harvardwood members. I think it's been really successful so far and I'm looking forward to continuing it in the future. Uh, let me please ask you at this time to at least put your phones on vibrate. Uh, you can, if you want to tweet that you're here, that would be fantastic, or uh, check in on Facebook, let everyone know that you're here. Uh, if you're interested, we are streaming this live on live stream on New Play TV, and you'll be able to watch the archived version starting tomorrow. Uh, if you're interested in that, feel free to email the Guild and I can send you the link if you can't find it on your own. Uh, Spence and Bart will be having a conversation first, but we will open up the floor for questions at the end. I ask that when you ask a question, please do so loud enough so that our online audience can hear you. All right, without any further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Spence Porter. Thanks, Taryn. <laughs> okay. Uh, for those of you who don't know what Harvard Wood is, shame on you. And Harvard Wood is Harvard's officially recognized organization for the arts, media, and entertainment. And we are just thrilled to do these events here at the Guild. And thank you, Terry. Thank you, Dramatists Guild. We love the Dramatists Guild. And uh, so tonight, I'm going to be talking to somebody who I personally consider one of the very best directors of our time. A, and uh, <laughs> Sorry, you timed that drink of yeah. water poorly. <laughs> I didn't warn him that was coming. And, uh, a lot of you will remember the production of South Pacific. He did a few years back. I was just in the other room telling him that when I saw it, I felt that I could not imagine a better production of that show. And uh, Tony Award winning production. And another music we did was Live in the Piazza, another lovely show, another Tony nomination for Bart. Awake and Sing, another lovely show, another Tony nomination for Bart. Uh, Golden Boy, running right now, eight Tony nominations, including Best Director and Best Revival. This guy is good. This guy is good. He also directs the Metropolitan Opera. He was formerly the head of the Intamin Theater for a decade. Uh, let's start talking. Okay. So I spoke to Terry Schreiber. Terry, as some of you know, is, I think, one of the, the two great New York acting teachers of his generation. He is just a brilliant exponent of naturalism and a superb director himself. And Terry told me that when he saw Golden Boy, he felt as if he was watching the group theater. Mm -hmm. And wow. this uh -huh. is an even bigger compliment if you know that Terry was a protege of Harold Clerman. Wow, that's amazing. So let's start with Golden Boy. Okay. What, first of all, you obviously have some sort of feel for Odette's, since this is your second Broadway Odette's production. Where does that come from? Um, I don't know. I mean, uh, uh, Andre Bishop, my boss at Lincoln Center, is the one who first uh, compelled me to look at Awake and Sing. And uh, I knew his work, but not that well, and I hadn't read it in a long time. And I read the material, and I, it absolutely came off the page incredibly clearly to me. I think that um, my, I think what I really love most about Odette's is his, his deep training in naturalism and his, and how it lifts into the poetic. He's got this great balancing act between the poetic and the naturalistic. A poetic in the prose, in the, in the depth of the writing, and um, at the same time, he's always angling to try to make sense of where, um, where the metaphor can go or where he's heading for. So if you take something like Golden Boy, it's a sort of invented problem between the violinist in us and the boxer, which is a war inside of his own psyche. And, uh, and yet, he imbues it with such believability and such truthfulness all the way through 
that it's a, a gorgeous thing. And it, I, I was attracted to that particular story because it seemed to me to speak a lot about the problem of success and what success does to a person and how it can chew you up and, and tear you to bits. And especially within the context of, for lack of a better word, rampant capitalism. There we are. And how long ago, <laughs> how early on did you know you were going to be directing Golden Boy? Um, most of the shows that I do have to be at least a year ahead. Yeah. I can't remember the exact time, but the preparation time has to start up to a year in advance. And what did you do to prepare for directing? Uh, well, the first, the first stage of this particular one was uh, spent at the New York Performing Arts Library because there was a lot of text that uh, cuts and texts and stuff taken out of the story. Um, I found that there were, if I didn't have any criticisms of it, but there was interesting text that had been cut for whatever reasons, especially, especially around a couple of particular areas that Walt Odette's, um, uh, Clifford Odette's son, gave us some permission to look at again. Uh, so a lot of time was spent with the text. Those areas really had to do with the father, his Italian, and with and his background, his his whole educational background, they seem to be. For lack, I mean, I'm uh, analyzing their Marxist materialist analysis. They seem to be trying to make make kind of idealized peasants. And actually, th there was a little bit of, in the original writing that he he talks about reading Garibaldi and Tolstoy and things like that, which we restored. And they had sort of cleaned all of that away. Also, there, and this is not a complaint about Odette's writing, the Italian itself is very rough Italian, kind of like pizza pie Italian, which now when you say it feels a little awkward. So a little bit of work went into that. And I translated some of the actual lines back into Italian and put them in the show in Italian, if they could, they could sustain, so that you could feel the deeper naturalism of an immigrant household in which a couple of languages were present and have, because I work in the opera it felt to me that that was something we could sustain and I was tr really working with Tony Shalhoub to, who was very naturalistic about it to really make him seem like a, a man who had these old world cultural values of arts, beauty, what it meant to be a man that were different than what his son was facing in the 30s and that was looked at. So that was the first step. Then the next step goes into design and goes into analyzing how to do it, and that one has particular problems. Uh, let's, let's talk a little bit well, about that. Well, the particular problems of that, sh that show are that as Odette's was moving along, he, um, he, he had spent more time um, in Hollywood. He wrote it while he was in Hollywood, already making quite a lot of money. And so it has eight completely distinct locations which often writers at that time would keep it, you know, Wake and Sing is all in the same house, all in the same room, so it's a single set. So we had a lot of work to go through to how to build a, what I call, you know, sort of the operating principle of the piece. Often now when you direct a play, a contemporary writer will give you a movie script and call it a play, and you always have to develop an entire mise-en-scene which allows you to switch locations a thousand times. and. Um, and there was a little bit of the beginnings of that in this, so we had to kind of spend a lot of time working through that. Plus, I always do look for, in Awaken Sing, I famously, and some people didn't like, that I flew the house out the middle of the scene, the whole house lifted up, and I pushed the play from its totally naturalistic stage to its completely, um, its completely poetic space at the end. And um, partly because it's very clear without being written in the thing that they're sitting Shiva at the end. That in all the descriptions of everything except it's, that word isn't used anywhere. And so I stripped the space in the same kind of way. And I was looking for similar metaphors in, in this piece, which what that last thing was about, what the last scene was about, what happens when you get into the last locker room scene and he decides to run off and he's covered in blood and how it gets pushed into the poetic Greek slash layers of the piece. You used the expression operating principle of the play. Yes. I'd like to come back to that. Yes. <laughs> well, yes, there's an operating mechanism in all plays that you have to, you're, you're always searching for the sort of internal 
rhythm, the internal structures of it. And, and so each one has its own, you know, sometimes the space operates the play. If you look at Shakespeare's space, the great advantage Shakespeare had is that the, the entire space of the globe, the inner above, the inner below, dictated the writing. He could write these quick switches of scenes because it would move from below to up or down, or, and he didn't have to ever change the set. He had a set that operated in a similar way to how a film works. So his mind is writing for a space. Playwrights just sit and write, you know, and the ones from a certain tradition in, in the mid, you know, will write, you know, the first one's in the drawing room, the second one's in, you know, whatever you have to think about the space in which it operates. So I'd always said if I was going to write a a book about directing would be called Reasons to Go Places. <laughs> and uh, um, because it's really odd to a lot of what our work is. It's like figuring out how to get somewhere and how to operate the movement. And the lengths of lines, the rhythm of the text dictates the kind of space it happens in. You've used the word rhythm a couple of times. Yes. I'm a very rhythmic person. Uh, I grew up in San Francisco and as a young person in the 60s and 70s, I had a lot of older brothers and they took me to Grateful Dead concerts <laughs> as a young, like a 10-year-old boy. And I thought, you know, they're this giant, unmediated cultural experience. Never mind what you think of the Grateful Dead, because that's a separate thing. But it was quite an interesting dramaturgical event, because the first act was always like a series of songs that everybody knew, and the second act was an entire experimental section in which they would go into all these places. And they had an improvisational quality to it, and they had a shared rhythm, and they would explore the rhythms of where they were going and like lift into whatever. And that, I didn't consciously know that I was absorbing that. So when I got my nose, and I do operas and I do things like that, when I've got my nose to a play, I'm really listening for the, what I call the inward sound of the piece, the internal rhythm of it, where its pulses are, where its breaths are. I can't know always in advance, but that's where my real heart is. And um, so it's probably the most important part of what I do, is look for the rhythm, try to get that pulse going, that rhythm of where it releases. Because an audience who comes into a play is spending the first 20 minutes tuning out of the 21st century and getting away from their their electronic devices and all that. So I'm always ha pretty happy if I see an audience member taking a short nap somewhere in the first act. <laughs> <laughs> because I think it's usually about like trying to re reconnect their time their personal time si signature. And there's always that click as Josh Logan used to call it where they click into the rhythm of the play itself. And so you if you go see a Shakespeare you'll often find the first 20 minutes you're sort of reeling from this new language and all that. And then something in the last 20 minutes, it's completely magical because you've released the world you were in. You've fallen under the spell or the rhythm of the piece it's in. And then the poetics and internal place that you can be get changed for the end. And if, and I'm, it's kind of shamanic work to try to get people out of their rhythm and into the rhythm of the work itself so that when they get to the fundamental questions it's asking, they're opening up into what's possible in an opera, in a musical, in anything else. And so I find it the most important part of my job as the interpretive artist of the evening. You know, being here at the Dramatist Guild, I have to separate myself from the creative artists. So that's a separate that's discussion a separate conversation. that we can argue yeah. about over dinner. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so that's that's why rhythm is a big part, and so if you if you if you look at something like it's always interesting when they translate Moliere because Moliere is these often iambic you know uh, five they always get translated into five foot lines with a rhyme at the end, but in the French they're six feet, and there's a big difference between dida 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 or just five, and I always look for translations that have six because you're going to find the rhythm that might be in there that deeper thing that's his rhythm his sensibility is going to find its way into something into something now before you can get the audience hooked into the rhythm you've got to get the actors hooked into the yes. rhythm again let's go back to golden boy yeah. what sorts of things did you do to prepare the cast for the show well the first thing you really do is is i spend a lot of time in the casting process 
uh, which I don't, uh, when I cast a show, I don't, I don't look, I mean, there are obviously types and there are certain kinds of people you need, but really what you're doing is a lot of diagnostic testing. Do they have the skills? Do they have the sensibility? Do they have the training? Do, can they verbally handle? Can they make good decisions? Are they capable of surprise? Do they bring a good mind to it? Are they an asshole? Whatever you want to find out in the middle of, a, of, a, of, a, of an audition is, is really worth probing to figure those things out. So collecting an ensemble is one in, is, is first step is good casting. The second step is the way I rehearse, the way I break down, you know, I spend a certain amount of time at the table, but not, not a lot. And I do, depending on the show, I will bring people in if it has deep historical stuff people need to know. In the case of Blood and Gifts, we brought in all kinds of people from Afghanistan and the region and got them to really think about that way of thinking, which was so different than ours. Or in South Pacific, we brought a lot of people in. Golden Boy, we knew the world largely. So we brought in a lot of people that were in, from the boxing world. Um, everybody from referees to um, co uh, trainers, boxers, and just let the cast try to push their mind toward asking them questions about who they were in the world. And what, and they got asked questions they weren't nor used to being asked. Um, you know, were, have, do you know of any uh, gay gangsters? That was one question. <laughs> because there's famously, which is also in the notes, Eddie Fuseli uh, uh, is very specifically in the notes of, um, of Odette's that he is a homosexual. And if anybody ever knew it, he'd kill him. And it's classic in the group theater slash Stanislavski tradition to build some secrets in. So they were asking all these crazy questions, and there's all these things that would go into that sort of world, plus the fight world, plus the... And that's one way. And then the way I rehearse is very, very precise, moment to moment to moment to moment, with a lot of repetition. But I make them sort of ask the questions I'm asking, so that we're all in the same place. Um, I don't... You know, and the way we break down the text, the way I go from moment to moment, they kind of start to tune in and realize they can use my process of the mechanics of my process to include their own questions in it. And that can be open for a lot of people. If someone like Mark Ruffalo, who was in Awake and Sing, was very slow to the process, he takes a lot of time to find his way, and then later he starts to build up information very internally. That person can work bit by bit by bit versus the ones who are very fast, but then kind of later on haven't asked themselves the question that Mark's asking. So it's a lot to do with the way I set a tempo for the work. That work continues, and then the best part of that work comes in note sessions when we finally get in performance and previews, where we're having a very large, very detailed, shared conversation about all of the new things that are to be discovered. Because all the best work usually comes in the last eight days when everybody knows exactly where they are and you're starting to gather information. And then even Stanislavski used to say, take 100 performances. You know, and after 100 performances, you start to fall into such a closeness with it that you really do learn the rhythm. And I try to build a process which you can deepen but not broaden, which to an actor should be very clear. Um, <laughs> but it wasn't to me. What um, me. Well, you don't want, you, you want the process where they can, can, you have to have it where you have like a, a, sh a shared sense of what are the actions I'm going to explore tonight. But I'm not going to change the blocking. I'm not going to go all over the place. But, I, but every night is going to be a, an opportunity to ask the question again with the person that's there. So you can surprise each other and you find the answers in each other. So often my shows will, can get, it, with a really great group, they get better and better and better because everybody each night is there to explore with good material how much further they're going to get. And so they... And I have to come in and check on it. But they usually have the great skill to keep that moving. And I try to build it with enough openness that it changes. Because I change my mind a lot, and I admit it. And I do think that there are directors who like try to create the impression that they know everything, and they're leading you to that thing <laughs> they know. That's not how I work. I work with, like, what are the questions we're asking, and how are we building it together? So that we're all inside the same conversation by the end. So to what extent do you have a sense of where you're going and not have a sense of where you're going when you start rehearsal? Yeah. Sounds like there's a lot still open for you at the beginning of the process. Um, well, the best way to describe this is if you were to take a painter like de Koenig, 
because I, the reason I like abstract expressionist is because the <laughs> figurative art is probably what people think of as closer to what we do in the theater because they're human beings in the picture, right? And you have to paint the figure. But if you take the abstract expressionist, you have layer upon layer upon layer that builds up to this, uh, say de Kooning is my favorite, like a beautiful expression of some cosmological information. You look at it and you're struck by how deep that is. And I think of my work as more in the, that world. Like we build up layer upon layer upon layer upon layer. We obviously have enough experience and I have enough understanding of where I want the thing to go. But I'm looking to build up the layers. So if you do a scene one way, you may find that much of what you're looking at is wrong. It, or not wrong, it's just not right for the character or it's too slow or it's too this or it's too that. Or you go down a path with what the assumption is and you feel that assumption doesn't work so you say let's get rid of that and go on but you can never get rid of it it's in the underpainting as it were and so when it's in the underpainting then you move to a whole other choice and you look at it all from this point of view and then five days later you go okay we're getting rid of that then you go over here and you look at it all from all that stuff goes into the jar like wine has sediment and those flavors those the complexity of, the, of it builds up from there and that is a lot of the way I describe the process, so that they're building on it, and then the actors get less panic because they don't think they have to get it right right away. They can explore something, they pull back, they go in another direction, and I just have to juggle and, hold, and maintain the deepening of the conversation. So you may find a good example is a character like Eddie Fuseli, who is the, the gay gangster, it's a very delicate character because he's the most brutal and most difficult guy in the thing. He's got the most to hide. And building up the layers upon which that works takes the longest time. Now, Tony Corbello was great at that and brave, and he had all these crazy secrets. He had his mother's watch. He had weird little rings. He had his hair in a special curl. He had all these crazy things he wanted to do, which were not all evidence to the audience, but were important to him. And I love secrets for actors. So you build all these things up and then you go there and then, but figuring out for someone like um, another actor what they think of that or what they're afraid of in that, that conversation becomes more complicated as you're going along. And they even say, you know, the character Moody says, you know, uh, he scares me, he says, um, Yvonne Starharsky's uh, uh, Lorna Moon says, says, and he says, why, because he's queer? And she says, no, not because he's queer, but because blah, 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 blah. And it just goes by like that. And it's a very interesting layer because, strangely, and even when you, when you get a sense of it, they, they, you could tell the whole audience probably in 1937 figured it out. And I like, I like when you direct. I think the real territory is not what's on stage and not what the audience is getting. It's the gray area in the middle, which is all the suggestion of what's going on. And if you lay in what the gray area is, you give the audience the opportunity to, to do its work. That's what you learn from Chekhov. It's all the things underneath the surface. It's all the things that are in the layers or in the subtext is as worked out as what's on the surface. And that's the area I work in, the gray area between the event and the audience. It's interesting blah, blah, blah. to me that I asked <laughs> about what you did with the cast to prepare for the show and you immediately talk about the things you did to get depth in the characters. Yeah. Because the reason that interests me is that when I asked the question, I thought you were going to talk about the things that you did to get the physicality of the boxing world, which you didn't even mention. No, because the, 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 the truth is that we brought in B.H. Barry. Seth Numerick is like obsessed with boxing. All the guys, as soon as you start doing boxing, all the guys get out and they all do other things. They're fine. <laughs> they're going to do it and they're going to do great and Seth was amazing at it and we had another guy, Dion Mucchiato I never say his name right he, he, he was incredibly good at it and they loved doing it and they worked really hard at it and we went to see boxing, we did all of that I didn't have to worry about that part what I have to worry about is is all the other things, that are, the deeper questions because usually when you do rehearse a scene you're going to do all the most result oriented choices at first it's going to be too loud, it's going to be too the joke's going to be too, you're going to be further from the truth than ever because you're playing all the emotional results right away. Then as you move along the process and you've unearthed all of it, it starts to get buried. And then it turns, the, the yes at the end of the question is filled with all that information, but it isn't telegraphing, showing the results, doing all that stuff. Uh, there's a 
my favorite maxim in the theater, which I've said before, is from ancient Indian dance. Um, Bratanatyam, at the beginning of the book of Bratanatyam, it says, where the eye goes, the hand follows. Where the hand goes, the heart follows. And where the heart goes, the essence is born. Heart is bhava, essence is rasa. All of the work we do is the distinction between bhava and rasa. You want the essence to be released in the audience. If, if the mother just lost her child and has just gotten this news on stage, she probably shouldn't cry. The audience should be receiving that essence. And because she's unable to cry, they fall apart. But we all know that performance. She starts wailing and screaming and all that, and we just worry about her. It's the whole question of what we do every single show is, is, is asking what is the difference between what is the heart and what is the essence and scrape pulling those things apart. In the same way the dancer is asking to follow into playing, dancing from the heart, not from the essence. And that's, you know, you would call that playing a result in, in acting class. And that's the fundamental operating principle of how I look at acting. You can do the same with a design. A design can be filled with too much essence. You know, you go in and you see something, it's a giant conceptual set you know, which is like all the gears and all the thing. And you're like, well, it's just too much information. I should be able to work out that that's what it is. That kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch off to another line a little bit. Okay. Uh, you work in a tremendously wide range of types of theater. Mm -hmm. How is your process, we've been talking right now about a naturalistic show. How yes. is your process different when you're doing Shakespeare, or Moliere, or Goldoni? Um, oh, well, okay, there's Goldoni, and there's Moliere, and there's Shakespeare. Yes. Yes. Let's start with Shakespeare. Shakespeare, I was lucky enough to work with Peter Hall, you know, who was a wonderful, wonderful teacher to me. I'm, um, and it all starts with language. It all starts with an analysis and understanding of the language, and he would break it into like three rules, and you, you're always, all the information comes from the language. Now, that isn't meaning, you know, there are those people who will say to you, you know, old actors who are yelling at you like, it's just on the page, you just look what's on the page. Well, that's, of course, true, but actually having the keys to understand what the irregularities are, how Shakespeare might be doing it, what a scene's doing, what the rhythm is, because the rhythm in a Shakespeare um, is different play to play. He writes the play he's writing. I mean, I've done like 20 of them, several of, many of them several times, and you start to learn each one has its own set of rules based on the kind of either the motifs or the rhythms or the, so if it's Richard II, it's more medieval and the language is much more clotted. When you get to Henry V, the language is more practical and, and, and precise given how the politics are changing. When you get to Henry V, it's filled with bombastic, you know, nationalistic sort of large scale rhetoric and then you build from there. So that's the key there. Goldoni's a whole different thing because Goldoni's the opposite from Shakespeare. Goldoni is essentially uh, scenario driven, and he was wrote the. And you know, you, I used to say Shakespeare makes genius of a lot of people because with the language there, it's all scripted. But to do Goldoni, you have to have enormous training and skill in say mask work, clown work, and take that, and you are the artist who pulls these scenarios into life. So one of my heroes is Giorgio Strehler, the great Italian director in the last century. And his, the pillars of his company were Goldoni on one hand and uh, Shakespeare on the other. Because the, the clown work and the sort of physicality of that work versus the, the work of uh, the language were the two places he built his company from. So they can be great teachers, either of them. Um, the, the classics in general are good because they push you into looking at the world in a certain way. My other major influence is a Polish avant-garde theater artist named Tadeusz Kantor, who I did a dissertation on in, in graduate school and who worked in the last century and was a great experimental artist who was a painter. So my influences of painting come out of that and into how he thought about metaphor and where it works in it. And he, for me, was the best, next to Brecht, the most revolutionary theater artist in the 20th century. And so I. Those, those sources are big for me against the classical sources. So there's, there's a lot of places it comes from. How's your process different when you're working with a living playwright who's there in rehearsal? Um, I tend to 
do it as a classicist. Um, I don't. Um, I'm not a. I, I'm not the kind. There are there are directors who are like, you know, you need a new scene here in the second act because yeah. this is blah, blah blah. You know, and they go through and they're very precise about that. I really feel I need to work on the piece and dig into the scenes for a period of time before I have anything to say. I have to treat it, see what you learn from Shakespeare is you can't change the text, right? So if you don't understand something, you have to keep pushing into the text to figure out what is there and get inside the rhetoric enough. And I tend to believe that the starting point with a new writer is you have to look at it the same way. You shouldn't, you don't know what the sort of deeper assumptions are until you spend some time with actors looking at it. So we're doing Bridges of Madison County coming up with Marsha Norman, who's the book writer, and Jason Robert Brown. And a lot of the time of that work has been, we've done four, three, four workshops. And it wasn't until the second workshop that I said, this song in the second act, I don't get it. But because I'd already worked for long enough to be able to start to say where it wasn't, the rhythm wasn't releasing for me. And now we're far enough along that we've built up enough information, but we haven't even done a production. So when we do a production, that will all change much more. So even if you hear about George Abbott, you know, moving all the tiles around, you know, in a show, that usually doesn't happen until you've dug deep enough into it. That doesn't happen like just seeing what you get. And that's where I think is the difference, is you have to be patient with yourself and your opinions of the writing and pretend that the writer has, even, may, even themselves may not know all the things they need to know about what they've made yet. Now, you just mentioned working on a musical. How does, how is the process different in um, very different circumstances of a musical production? It probably helped to work on Shakespeare and verse before working on musicals. Musicals are um, elevated speech <laughs> in the form of singing. And so, you know, um, if people ask, you know, what, what makes a good musical? Well, something where you have to sing. <laughs> you have to have a reason to sing. You know, so if it's, um, you know, if it, it, it's where the speaking leaves off and the singing must begin. And that's, that's the difference. It, I'm probably better at the more naturalistic musical than I am at the more stylized musical. You know, so when it becomes a big production number and a big dance thing and a whole thing, that's a different kind of work than I should probably do. I'm probably better at something like Piazza, um, South Pacific, the experimentation that those guys were doing, perhaps some, Sondheim, some of the Sondheims. I get more into that version of it than, the, than 42nd Street. Not that I don't admire it and think it isn't amazing, and the vocabulary of dance at that level is extraordinary, but I'm probably better suited to, to where it's, the heightened expression, and then uh, I find them. I find them amazing. The the interesting part is there's such a deep difference in the personalities, actors versus people in musicals versus opera singers. They're just the worlds are vastly different, and the the act my activity of what I do isn't largely different, but I do have to adjust myself in each world. Uh, you just brought up opera, where it really is uh, outlining a couple of the differences. Okay, you've got singers who have a limited language in common to begin with. They may or may not have acting talent. They may or may not have acting training. And it's a production that won't run continuously, and there will be somebody else stepping in as each cast change happens. How do you deal with all of those? Well, I mean, it's interesting. Preparing for an opera is probably the most demanding of all of them. Um, I, ha I, am, I spent all day today working on Faust, Gounod's Faust, which I'm doing a year from now. And, um, you know, I have a friend who I've worked with a long time, Peter Still, who was nominated for a Tony for um, uh, Golden Boy. He's a sound designer and is a great musician. He spends a lot of time with me. We go through every single note of it. It takes two to three weeks. We're halfway through. Who knows fast? And um, you have to get inside the music first. In the same way you have to get inside the language. I, I have to spend a lot of time working on the music. So before I get to that singer, the singer himself, Anna Netrebko, Juan Diego Flores, whoever there, they're going to know it better than I know it. And they you have to keep in mind that that's the most heightened level of stuff. So I always 
I always say preparing them for an opera is like getting you know the Yankees ready for a game. When we work on a play, we work and work and work and we rehearse and rehearse and we go over it and we go over and go over it. So by the time it moves on to the stage, we know very incrementally what's going to happen. When you work on an opera, first of all, you have no time. You do lay in all of the things you do. You stage it, you shape it in the same way. But they don't sing full out every rehearsal because they would never survive it. You don't really know the full extent of where they're going to go. Um, the Trepko might say, oh, but you talk too much. Oh, please. <laughs> you know? um, and I'll say, I know, I know. Listen, listen. And, and we have a great relationship. But you know, you're, you're deepening their experience of, say, Le Lazier, which she's done many times. And then when you get to that performance, they swing for the fences. They play really hard. And you have to prepare them to be able to reach to that. And you have to build an interpretation, which is going to be supportive of many people doing it so that the building blocks in that interpretation can be filled and f with different people so it's an interesting question I don't think about that I don't think about the like oh many people doing it I think about my best version of Barbara Seville or my best version of Le Lazier or Gounod's Faust and I get underneath the subtext in exactly the same way doing a, a play that's what drives Anna crazy because I make her think about it in ways she's never thought about it but that's still the same process for me. That's not how other people do opera. And opera is an amazing interpretive art form because there's extreme, extremely, you know, place interpretations where the text, where the, the, the interpretation is very far away from what the text may originally have meant. And that can be incredibly interesting. I tend to be a little bit more in the middle, like in the Strayler world, as opposed to the Stefan Herheim world or the Calixto Bieto, which is really pushing it way out. But opera is also a difficult form because it's m many people who go see an opera will have seen 30 or 40 different productions of the same opera. And they're listening for different things and they're looking and plumbing into different parts of it. So what they want, that's what makes the experience of it so diverse, the very conservative wing versus the extremely liberal wing. And finding a ground in the middle there is or any ground in there is complicated. Now, when we got together before we came out here, you scribbled a few things on a piece of paper that might be interesting to talk about, and then we got talking to each other. I never asked you what you meant by them. So I'm glancing right now, and I see the words background and influences. Oh. What did you have in mind? You know, the Grateful Dead. Ah, we <laughs> talked um, about that already. Yeah, no, okay, the Grateful great. Dead, Tadeusz Kantor, um, uh, uh, you know, Wally Schenk, uh, you know, that kind of world, yep. that the ones who built me up. Okay, we got to that. We got to that one. And did we also get to the field cultural diffusion? That's, that's a much more complicated question. Um, Tell me uh, what the question is so that I can uh, ask. Yes, I'm, my biggest obsession recently as media explodes and as so many people and bloggers and critics and everybody's in the middle of the same universe when we do something like Golden Boy at Lincoln Center we really are trying to make contact with our own traditions we're trying to deal with the group theater and we do it at the Belasco where they originally worked we try to explore those traditions and find that corridor when Giorgio Strahler did his many productions of Servant of Two Masters he went into the Louvre and he explored the mask tradition and he built his own tradition again and he tried to really connect himself in time to his ancestors. I'm finding currently in the world that it's becoming so diffuse, these lines of narrative with our past, and so blurred that it's becoming complicated. You've experienced it in the world of politics. It used to be clear what the line of our traditions were between our parties over compromise and things like that. And now it's so diffuse and blurred that no one can get a grip on it. And in a weird way, we're experiencing a similar, in the hugely transformational time we're in, where media and other things are changing so much, and how we communicate is switching so quickly, and people can communicate in so many ways, the ability to concentrate and stay in contact with our own traditions without letting them blur into this diffuse blast of stuff is, for me, the biggest question. It's the, it's the place where it's the most difficult to understand where we are in that and what expresses who we are in that and who is connecting us to that. And so it affects training. It affects, you know, the questions we ask. It affects 
you know, when you go to the movies, you're like, well, what movie am I going to go see? You know, because <laughs> you're like looking for something that may be able to speak to the questions we, you know, I grew up in the regional theater, which used to have a very clear sense of like traditions and heroes and things like that. And now it's sort of becoming so pulled apart. And I used to worry that it was me. You know, I was just getting older and I should just accept it. Um, but I do worry for younger artists where they find themselves in the work and in the traditions of the work and where they're learning from and what conversations you can have with them. Because if I talk to, I talk to a young person and I'll say, yes, if you looked at that production and, you know, in the work of Watteau and in this particular thing here, and they will say, who's Watteau? <laughs> and what's those things? And you're like, but... It doesn't mean they don't know anything. It just means that we're not having the same conversation. And, and yet, we're all doing the same work. And that's where it's getting diffuse. And that's where I'm asking that question of myself. And uh, without naming names or saying anything that could produce problems later, uh, any thoughts on the role of critics in the theater right now? Well, it's one of the biggest questions of what we do is, the critic has the job of holding a line of narrative together, connecting us to our past, speaking for the traditions, and keeping us in contact with where we are as we move ahead. It's a very difficult job. I think I, I used to talk about critics as the last collaborator, the person who explains why this production pushes us to the next place in the work. And I think whether it's an opera critic, or whether it's a theater critic or a, you know critics and musicals, it's the capacity of the of a, a, a another group helping. You know, we'd have Kenneth Tynan, you know, or we'd have. Um, uh, uh, I'm, I mean, there's millions of, of intellectual writers and thinkers who were trying to help us when I was growing up that we would all read, and now it's a little harder to keep an eye on what that is and what. You know, because we can always look to the Brits, because, you know, in England they have a, a, a more cohesive culture, a more ho homogenous culture, so their theatrical tradition is a little easier to describe, is given a little bit more street cred in terms of its intellectual nature, rightly or wrongly. But in our world, talking about American culture, talking about it in an intelligent way, connecting up who we are, with, as diverse as we're getting, as the politics we're dealing with, these are hard, critical questions to ask. The artists have to ask them, and you want the critics to ask them on a political, on a cultural, on a semiotic, on a hermeneutic, on all these levels of who we are. You want that. So one of the th and the bloggers all join in, and so there's this giant screaming conversation going on, in which people are acting out their ids and egos in a million ways, but not really. But which questions are they asking? You know, in, in terms of who we're becoming, and which artists are dealing with that. And that's, those are the questions that are important to continue to address. Not just that I'm the one dealing with them, I'm not saying that. I'm saying we need in the critical community those lights, those people who are compelled and interested in trying to assess where we are in the same way the artists are trying to assess where we are. It's a critical artistic function. And that's interesting because right now you read these think pieces and it's complicated. You think, haven't I read that before? Yeah. What are they saying? You know, and you, it's hard. It's hard. And uh, you mentioned dealing with young directors earlier. Yeah. Uh, when you deal with one, young directors, what advice do you give them about <coughs> building a career, creating art? Well, it's funny. Work? We talked about this. I, I grew up in a world where we, you, I, because I grew up in the 60s and 70s, and it was a countercultural movement, and it was filled with all kinds of countercultural ideas. It was the really dirty word when I was growing up was career. It was a nasty word. You weren't allowed to talk about your career, and you'd be called a sellout and all these things that were really bad, which now everyone wants to be famous and rich, and they want to be told they're a genius. And, I mean, we have our mothers to do that, I guess. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, they're not important qualities to want. You know, I mean, they are important. We want to make a living. And I think the nature of rampant capitalism makes us so afraid because we don't have proper health care and we don't. That's where the English have an advantage. They're not as afraid. We're afraid. We're trying to struggle. We're trying to make a living. We're trying to get along. So the one, the first thing I always say to a young director is, and this is, is stay out of debt. 
Because if you want to be at the mercy of capitalism, you will have large debts. And a lot of the time they go to graduate schools, they build up debts, they go to colleges, they go to all these places. And it makes, it, it makes the experience of what they're doing really difficult. So that's one part of it. The other is, you know, you do have to, to push way ahead in the future, you do have to learn your past. In whatever way you're going to learn it, you have to become interested in that and, and be asking, create a dynamic relationship to the culture in which you are compelled to make connections and ask questions and find out where you are and why we're here. And these are old questions, but the fundamental questions of who am I and why am I here and what does it mean and what are we doing, and which are underneath all of the things we make, have to always be asked every single time. And there are many ways to do that. And there are many, many, many wonderful young directors out there who are doing incredible work right now who are asking those questions. And they get, that's the place to be. And, um, and also to feel a relationship to, your, to history because, you know, essentially we live just short enough lives that we forget everything over and over again. <laughs> and it's a little bit of a problem. Um, and so it all gets, you know, it all kind of starts, the wheel starts over again and that's where it's complicated. And now I think it's your turn to ask some questions. How would you describe yourself as an audience member when you go to see a show? What is it that you're, are you there to be entertained or to see what other people are doing or some combination? Oh my God. Um, I'm hoping to get a nap. <laughs> um, no, I'm kidding. Uh, I think it isn't easy for me to be an audience member. I, I won't kid you about that. Um, I, I, it's very hard not to have a critical mind when I watch something. Um, if I go and watch a piece, a theater piece, and, and I find the floor plan, like basic X's and O's, to be out of sorts, or I can't help myself from making these analysis of what the space is doing and how it operates. And I apologize when I do that to anybody I go see, but it is not easy. My critical mind is hard to turn off. I'm, I do, though, think that I am the kind, I want the same thing everybody wants. We want, we want to leave the theater lightened and free and open to new things that we, and, and seeing the world in a fresh, joyful way, not exhausted and worn out and pissed off. <laughs> and both things happen, but the first one less often than the second one. <laughs> and uh, I think that but having those experiences, I was in London not too long ago and I went to see Bruce Norris's new play, The Low Road, which is an amazing play. And I went with David Yazbek, who wrote uh, Women on the Verge, who's a musician with me. And it was one of those great experiences directed brilliantly by Dominic Cook at the Royal Court. It was one of those experiences that was just a great, great intellectual, incredibly rich, incredibly exciting experience of a great piece of theater. And it's the best thing to happen. And no matter what you say or how jealous you're going to be or how kind of competitive you are or all that, that's really what you want every time you go. It doesn't happen very often, but it's what you want. Are there any on Broadway now or off Broadway that you oh, recommend? Um, you're not obligated to answer. Yeah, no, I mean, yes. I, I, I've been able, you know, Kinky Boots is great, and Matilda's great, and I saw Pippin, it's great. They're all great. They're, they're different. That, that, that peak experience I'm talking about, what I probably am tired of is, is this, this sort of drug impact of going to the theater. The people go now as a kind of substitute for some drug experience. It's like crack. And they have to kind of get off. And they have to have a huge emotional experience, have their mind blown, and this was incredible. And they have to be somehow transformed in this way. The obligation of that crack is pretty hard to live up to. And I think it creates a kind of exhausted public. Because, you know, short of actually dropping something in their Coke on the way in, <laughs> it's pretty intense to live up to that. And I know that from being a deadhead, because when you're a deadhead and you go from show to show to show to show to show, you're comparing this peak experience from that one, from that one, from that one. So I know the kind of um, addiction that goes into our seeking, and then that leads to other dissonances of like, well, they didn't do this, and it should have been that, and it should have been that. That kind of thinking 
as much as we're all susceptible to it, is part of the other dangerous quotient. If you don't serve somebody's crack, they come down even harder in their anger. And, you know, that's a weird experience. It's where, and, and New York's kind of unique that way, where they're like, we're all in the game of handicapping each other. And it's intense. That's an intense one. Oh. Uh, what's been your worst and your best experience with a producer? Um, I've never done a commercial production. I've only worked in, in nonprofit supportive environments. So I haven't been, and I think most really good commercial producers are the ones who balance the experience of the artist against the commercial interests of the production. And that's, that's a hard line to find in these worlds. Um, so because I work at Lincoln Center, I'm in a pretty good, it's a pretty good environment for making something good. It creates a different question about like what happens in the sort of high, high risk nature of Broadway versus the safer confines of Lort or of regional theater or of, you know, you know, we all love the Brits, but they live in very, very supported um, state subsidized circumstances, which allow for a lot of risk and uh, a, lot of, a lot of experimentation, which is not as easy in the commercial world. So I think, I think those things have a balance they find with each other in the best of circumstances. And there are great producers out there, many of them. I've worked with Jeffrey Richards or Scott Rudin or, um, you know, there are a lot of them out there. But it's, it's a, the one part of our business that needs the most great people is in the producing area. And the most artistic and the most sensible and the most intelligent balancing act. And that is a very special art of its own. That's true. Um, I actually have two questions. Sure. Um, they're, they're process questions. Sure. Um, that I think about a lot. And one of them is how do you balance talking with your actors about the text and about their characters and playing and getting into the finding reasons to go places? Um, and the second question is how do you work with your actors and finding the deeper opportunities that performing offers to connect their own qualities and their, the things in their own lives? The second one's easy. I'm not interested in their own lives. I mean, I will ask about it, but I don't think I, I don't think you need to, you know, have lay down in front of a railroad to know what it's like to be run over by one. <laughs> and the whole point of our work is that we put ourselves in imagined circumstances we may not have experienced, and that there is some shared understanding of asking those questions. The first part is you have to ask, and I do I do pry into their lives. Don't get me wrong. But, um, but I, I, don't, I don't think it's germane. I, we've all seen the experience. It's like, you know, we've all, I, I, we've all seen the experience of great performances from people who are not, you know, um, uh, who don't have that particular life experience. And, you know, uh, so I don't, that part I don't, I don't, I think that's not art. We're artists, so we make up things we don't know. Um, and that's the fun of what we do. The first part is that you have to ask the questions of the text based on what you know is actable, not just on like what it means. The problem that get, the academic gets into the depth of what it means, and a lot of academic writing is unhelpful to what a director does. I have to ask the questions in doable, actable terms. So I'm always plowing into the depth of the text from the point of view of the doing, the obstacles, and looking for, my process is about looking for the clues in the text that are creating what am I fighting against? What am I not facing? What am I, so that the actor has things to do. The biggest problem for actors is what is it I'm doing? And what is it I'm struggling with? So, and, and I, one great actor I worked with, Chris Jones, used to say, give me more obstacles. So you're always looking for those things that push against. So you have that, or if you do a Cisbury exercise where you're doing, you know, texts of Hamlet and eight people hold a person while he talks about his father and just the pure physicality releases his voice and he just, that's what we need to find in the theater is what is the doable stuff. So as you're plowing into the depth of it, you're looking for that. 
you know, and what you're struggling with. And that takes a long time to name. I call it naming. So that's why, you know, that those note sessions that happen toward the end are where all of the stuff that you were asking and stumbling and making no sense of in the beginning is starting to make sense toward the end. The hard part for a young director is trusting the period where you don't know what the fuck you're talking about. And you're, you're asking it in an interesting enough way that people keep trying and you maintain the trust with the actor that it's okay not to know. It's okay to make big crappy choices that don't. And that, and create a, a generous enough authority in the room that everybody can be shitty for a long time. It's when people panic and they think they're gonna be bad and they don't think you've helped them and they, you get into that place that everything gets crazy. And that's the place you don't wanna be. Did that help you? Yeah, and may I ask a follow-up question? Yeah, sure. Um, what's your process when working with text where there is very little information about the physical world um, with presenting or discovering what this obstacle there may be for the scene? Okay, so again, reasons to go places. The, the physical, <clears throat> we can have a long talk about space, creating a space. A space in which the envelope of the of the play happens. Um, if you take something like uh, the naturalism of Awake and Sing, you know, we started with Boris Aronson's space, you know, the one he originally made, because in fact they wrote a kind of thing in relationship to that space. And you know, actors need things to, you know, there's a lot of levels of doing. There's physically doing. There's the essential doing, as they say in sort of acting class. There's, so there's a literal, what am I physically doing, and then there's what am I trying to do, accomplish. I'm trying to, to, to persuade this person to, you know, I'm trying to face blah, blah, whatever that is. But the literal doing is an important one. So, you know, having a drink card, having a reason to go down left, having a reason to be by yourself, having a reason to know, you know, it, it, it's, people don't realize if, say, it's French, Moliere thing, there's the person talking here and then the aside here and like the reasons to go down there. You have to find the rhythm of that so they have that moment, they can come back in. So you're looking for the doing. And so I call it reasons to go places, which I learned from Garland Wright, because when you work on a thrust, you have this giant space downstage, you have to put the drink cart down in the bomb so that if it's the naturalistic play and you're doing the Noel Coward, you have to get from the couch, which has to be above where the people are sitting so it's not blocking them. And you have to go down to the drink cart to get something while you get away from your wife who you can't stand anymore and think for a second before turning up stage and saying, you bitch, I'm going to kill you. But that moment of getting up and crossing down to the drink cart and considering what you're going to do is the moment where the directing happens. Right? Because that's the moment where the audience gets inside your head separate from what the other person's thinking. And you're always trying to find the dance, which is opening people up inside of where the gray area is. And you see those flights of hand that help people see what's really going on. And that's, an opera is a big example of that because in opera you may have a Rossini with a million repetitions and you come back around the same time over again. So you have to have a whole reason to do it again and say why it's different this time. And they're the greatest action exercises of all time. Because you've already done the scene once and now you have to do it two more times, <laughs> exactly the same way. And you have to then rename it each time you come through. And that's fun. Did that sort of help? Yeah, yeah and so it, you, if your piece is more abstract, you have to pick, build an abstract world which give reasons to, to create a physicality that builds out from there. I don't know the, the, the specifics of what you're talking about, but that's important. Yeah. You're talking about um, moving around, I wonder if that word. Have you worked a lot with actors who have dance training? I'm obviously a subject to the question. But, and do you find that having the physical, instinctively having certain physical movements helps to fire up the reasons for the character doing whatever? I mean, has to be doing. Do you know what I'm trying to I say? I don't know how you can be a great actor without having a great relationship to your own body. Dance helps. Dance may be a way of releasing yeah. that. If you look at, you know, Meryl Streep, the greatest actress of all time, the mask work, just the pure physicality that she always finds in everything is extraordinary. Laurence Olivier, uh, 
Nathan Lane. Yep. Um, you know, the, the, the body is one of the tools through which you're carving this person. So good training helps an actor be in touch with that tool. It may be that they use it through dance, it may be they use it through La Bon movement, and who knows what it is. But there, you have to be in touch with your body. You have to know what your body's doing. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. Yeah? You talked about um, the importance of being in touch with culture and traditions of, of your field. And I was interested to hear your thoughts about uh, musical theater and particularly uh, contemporary new musical theater and show that you worked on and their connection with the traditions of you know, European theater or uh, musical theater. Right? What's the question? Um, should, I, should they have them? And, and, what's, <laughs> and what's the nature of, of the, the musical theater's connection with its traditions? Well, usually, you know, the the tradition of musical theater, you know, starting in the early part of the century with Oscar Hammerstein and Showboat and, you know, just at least having a cursory understanding of how the form has built and evolved. You don't, you know, it's not going to make you a better director, but you do, I do think you want to stand a little bit in the corridor of what's going on. Often, the director will have less of that understanding than the composer might. The composer is going to, I think, needs to know where they are in that. Uh, I'll give a an example of, um, I'm working on a new opera by a young, amazing, brilliant composer named Nico Muley, who went to, um, went to Juilliard. He's, uh, he, you know, he, we're doing an opera that's based on something that happens on the internet. And there's all these characters on the internet, and it's a very comp, there's all these choruses that head off onto the web. Well, his real tradition that he's most attracted to is you know, Thomas Tallis and Gibbons and 15th century Tudor church music and Stravinsky and like Philip Glass. So these choruses that head off into the internet, you know, sound like the most beautiful, um, uh, extraordinary, huge opening up of sound that could have been very appropriate in a 15th century um, church, except that they're saying, shut the fuck up, you'll be sorry, which is the, the language of the internet. But very beautifully said in this gigantic <laughs> sound with 60 people singing it. Now that's an opera version of like, where does the form push itself next? Because we are different and this is how we communicate and this is where we come from. It could be Adam Gettle who, obviously his you know, grandfather's Richard Rogers, but he's very, very much a student of where he is in the form. His own voice is his own voice, which is important. But he knows where he is in the form better than anybody I know. He's unbelievable instincts for the form. That's all I mean. I, I, it doesn't make a better artist of you, but you know, if you're Stephen Sondheim and you were mentored by Oscar Hammerstein, that's helpful. It doesn't make Stephen Sondheim better necessarily because he was already brilliant and he, he has the impulse within himself to push it ahead, but it is critical also for just being in the corridor is, I guess, the best way to think about it. I think we've got time for one more. Okay. Yes, um, you were talking about earlier uh, what you were looking for when you were casting. Now, that was for the theater, but in the opera world, as I understand it, most of these opera singers are booked way ahead. Yes. Do you have anything to say about that? And also, how is it working with several languages, which also happens when you have a cast of uh, singers? Um, I have virtually nothing to do with the casting in an opera house. Uh, they are done long in advance. Some of the smaller roles I will be consulted about. Um, Sarah Billinghurst at the, at the Met uh, is amazing casting. Um, she's one of the best eyes for casting of anybody I've ever met. And uh, she does all the cast, a lot of the casting at the Met. And um, yes, those are done long in advance. Um, the second part of your question? Um, and, it was how you were dealing with all the different languages. Oh, um, I mean, I have to deal with the language of my own text, you know, uh, which is, I prepare my text in a particular way, which is 
these simultaneous translations and it takes a long time to put them together and uh, so I, I'm most, most concerned in the room with the language in which the opera is happening. Uh, often what will happen is you have very, very high level of assistants at the Met who are the best directing assistants you could have, each of whom speak numerous languages. And so if there is somebody there, and often everybody in the opera world who travels all over the world speak at least three or four languages, and they're usually comfortable with English, but if they aren't, somebody is going to be there who speaks the language they speak. I do find if there is a real language barrier, it can be complicated. And that can happen in any, you know, because you can think you're un being understood in one way when you aren't. And that is, I have run into that, so. Mark, you've been wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.